right, we are ready for our last session. Um, our first presenter of this final session is Dr. Ed McGinley. Dr. McGinley is an Associate Professor of Natural Sciences at Flagler College. He has worked as a technician on an oyster farm, researched the feeding habits of stream fish, and taught lab and lecture sections of human anatomy and physiology. Dr. McGinley's doctoral research focused on the feeding habits of striped bass in the Chesapeake Bay. Between the small class sizes and the proximity to an estuary, Flagler College has been a perfect destination for him. His current research investigates the ecology of estuarine species, often using, using marinas as study areas. Dr. McGinley likes to involve undergraduates in all of his projects, which allows them to experience the research process. And today, Dr. McGinley will be sharing about um, establishing a database of North Florida green sea turtles. So Dr. McGinley, I know you have some former and current students here and I will pass it to you. All right. So I have not gotten controls yet. If you navigate to the view options panel. Uh, request remote control, there we go. Okay, and we even went over that and I still forgot. You are good to go now. <laughs> thank you. All right, and thank you everyone um, for organizing the, the symposium today. This is definitely uh, uh, one of my favorite events of the year is uh, the State of the Reserve, just seeing all the really cool information coming out of the our own backyard here. So thank you to Caitlin and Abby for organizing this and all the presenters. Um, in putting this presentation together today, you know, we're all out of sorts, obviously, with everything going on. I have all of my undergraduate co-authors on here, some who are actually watching this. And of course, I forgot to put their pictures actually in the presentation. So I do apologize to my students. Um, but without them, this project never would have gotten to the point where it is. Chris Cow is a colleague in the math department at Flagler who has helped me navigate some of the uh, coding involved with the project. And then Scott Eastman, as always, is a wonderful resource uh, bouncing ideas off of for this project. So yes, um, I like a good acronym, uh, Marina Observation of Sea Turtles. Most, I always like spelling out a word. Um, so I'm gonna kind of go through how the project was started and where we're at right now. Um, so, Obviously, the pandemic is a very serious situation. Um, there's, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of suffering associated with that. Just kind of on a minor note, what I noticed last summer was after the college basically uh, kind of shut down and we couldn't really do research projects with students. Is how much of my day revolves around doing work with undergraduate students. So having to basically cancel a lot of those projects because I didn't have the support. Um, this is this is kind of how I felt, um, just you know, adrift. Um, so I thought to myself, I need to kind of start some research projects that I can at least start on my own and then get students involved with as we as we go on. So one of the favorite things I like to do is go to our local marinas. The harbor masters at these marinas have been wonderful in the past with allowing us to set up some projects. And the original intent was to go to this these marinas, the conch house marina is in the uh, the or orange arrow below, the Comanche Cove Yacht Harbor is the orange arrow on top. The goal was to go and put out these habitat baskets, these cylinders with one inch openings and fill them with oyster shell and, and see again the fish and crab species that colonize these traps. I'm a fish biologist by training. A lot of my experience has been in uh, fisheries work, so obviously went there with, with that intention. But as you know, life tends to do, uh, I got on a, a tangent here. Uh, as my students can attest, I do in the classroom, I do it in my research as well. So as I was walking around the marina, this is from, I believe this one's Comanche Cove. I'd have to go back and look at the, the metadata on the picture. But as I was walking around the marina, I noticed I, I was seeing sea turtles and that's not necessarily anything new. 
But in the past, I had a student who was interested in trying to identify sea turtles based on the barnacle patterns on the shell. Uh, she was able to go to the St. Augustine Marina and look at some of the turtles and was able to find that she was able to identify some as uh, previous ones that were seen. After she gave that capstone presentation, one of my colleagues, Ben Atkinson, suggested we might want to look at the head scales. They are more unique, they're more permanent, and might provide an easier way for us to do a, a mark recapture project. So this all started to come together. I took that picture. Anyone who knows me knows I like taking pictures of everything I see outside. I'm the person on campus that people will look at odd as I'm kneeling on the sidewalk taking pictures of a, a beetle walking across the sidewalk. So um, this one picture here started this project idea kind of rolling around. So I went to the literature to try to find out how other people have done this. And when I started, I, I kind of came up with these two hypotheses as this is what we're really interested in. I wanted to see if we could identify green seed turtles at marinas by just using the head scale photographs. And then could we come up with some kind of population estimate for green sea turtles at the marinas based on these recapture numbers? So as I said, I'm a fisheries biologist, even though these guys have flippers, not exactly what I'm used to studying. So I really didn't know too much about their life history. The ones we are seeing at the marinas are these juveniles, these three to 10 year old. I know this because we've had to rescue a couple of them and they are not 55 to 200 pounds. So I was able to pick them up. So my anecdotal, how big are they? They were definitely less than 55 pounds. Um, so these are sea turtles that are uh, kind of, they're coming back to these coastal areas. They're coming into estuaries. And normally they'd be feeding on the submerged aquatic vegetation in an area, but due to the turbidity of our water, they're not necessarily feeding on that food source. They're present at uh, anthropogenic structures like boats, marinas, pilings, eating the macro algae that's growing on these structures. So that provides a really kind of non invasive method of looking at these sea turtles because they're at marinas, they're used to people walking by, we're not doing anything that they're not used to, to being around. Um, so we're able to get some really good pictures of them at the surface feeding. Um, and I also had to kind of go through and learn what I'm looking at with the morphology of scales, with the morphology of uh, the turtle in general. And originally when we started doing this, I bless her heart, Emma Wilkinson, who's watching this, who did a poster presentation, she would go through and kind of count and document every sea turtle that we were seeing with the pictures and, and kind of make notes on what the head scales look like. And that quickly became apparent this was not the best way to go about doing this. Um, I had a friend as I was kind of midway through the project ask me, well, do their scales change on their head at all? And I thought well, that, that probably is something I should have looked at at the beginning. But luckily, uh, this paper here by Carpentier et al. from 2016, they looked at the, the scales on these green sea turtles to see, do they remain stable? And indeed they do. So these two photos are the same sea turtle. They were taken almost 1700 days apart, so four and a half years. And you can clearly see on the photo that these scale patterns haven't changed. There might be some minor changes on the ones towards the periphery, but these major scales aren't changing. So this does offer a stable way to mark a turtle without having to put anything on, without having to engage uh, or handle the sea turtle. To show you that there is a lot of variation here, these are three different pictures, uh, or I should say three different sea turtles. Um, picture on the left, we can see lots of divisions in these scales. Um, the turtle in the middle, we're kind of getting more of the right hand or right side of the head. Picture on the left, we're getting a little bit more left of the head. And then the one on the far right, we're getting the top of the head. So we, as we were trying originally to use these programs, I contacted a researcher, Cassie Stoddard at Princeton, who sent us code for a program called Nature Pattern Match. And Chris Cow was gracious enough to try to help me decipher this. Um, 
it became apparent that it was not the easiest program to use. Going back to the literature, we found another program called Hotspotter, which is an app that you can download. And it was much more user friendly. The researchers in, in California at Loma Linda University, uh, Dustin Bombeck and Steve Dunbar met with us several times on Zoom and showed us how to use the program. So without their help, we wouldn't be where we're at. So the program Hotspotter, how does this work? Well, after we've walked the perimeter of a marina, we have taken pictures of the left side, top and right side of the head of the sea turtle if we can. Sometimes the sea turtles are not as uh, cooperative as you would hope. Sometimes they swim away. So we got the best shots that we could. I oriented any picture that I was looking at the top of the head, pointing towards the top of my computer screen, left to the left of the screen, right to the right of the screen. This way the program knew uh, kind of the orientation and it could look for random spots or it would pick random spots on the head and then see if two pictures matched and it would take a, a subsampling of these random spots for each turtle. So what we've done is we've created a database. So every marina that we've gone to, we see X number of turtles. We upload that with a unique identifier for the date, the marina, and which turtle we saw, as well as whether it was the left, right, or top of the head. Then we do a, a, a query, the orange box you see on the top left, that's our region of interest. So it tells the program, if there's uh, biofouling on the wall behind the turtle, don't include that. Just look at this box that we're telling you to look at. And then it'll compare to every other picture in the database to find the most likely match. The default on our program is uh, six pictures. So the top picture in each of these comparisons you'll notice is the same. That's the one we're telling the program try to help us figure out which turtle this is. The bottom picture are the most likely candidates. So there is still a manual uh, aspect of this that we have to go through and look at, but we don't have to go through a thousand pictures. We go through six pictures. I then created a name if the turtle's the, the same. Um, most marina observation of sea turtles, 20 for 2020, which turtle this is. So this is 007. Um, just so happened the one I picked was uh, the James Bond turtle. And then which sighting it was. So every subsequent sighting, it would be sighting two, sighting three, sighting four. And that has allowed us to figure out how many times are we seeing these turtles? So the data we've looked at so far is June, July, and the first week of August. The, at the beginning of the project, I wasn't sure if this was going to work, how often we would need to get out and mark these turtles with a picture. So it hasn't been the same duration between each sampling. But just to give you an idea, in that uh, two month period, we've seen 113 unique sea turtles. Um, we've seen the majority of them, the bars on the left are Concast, bars on the right are Comanche Cove. Majority of them were seen one time, but there was a turtle even in that two month period, we saw six different times at the Concast Marina. For Concast, it took us a couple times before we started seeing recaptures. So we were about 20 days in before we started seeing recaptures. And for the most part, we're still seeing new turtles every time we go. So the white bars are unmarked, the gray bars are marked turtles. So in that two month period, um, we're still seeing unique turtles. And that actually is, is still the case as we're analyzing our pictures from November. Comanche Cove, same idea. We see more recaptures as, uh, as we're kind of going on here, but again, we're still seeing unique turtles, um, which is kind of really cool because we know that then the population is fairly large. This, these marinas Three are minutes. supporting a, uh, a large number of turtles. A quick and dirty way to look at population size. We did the Schnabel method. Conkhouse, after 11 visits, we're estimating there's probably about 143 turtles we've seen during that time, but a big confidence interval because we're getting fewer recaptures. Comanche Cove, probably about 64 turtles and the confidence interval is much smaller. Um, so our hypotheses fail to reject both. We've been able to identify them. We've been able to estimate populations. And since we're running low on time, I wanna make sure that I hit this point here. Uh, if you notice on this turtle on his right flipper, there's a metal tag um, and I actually see a question, which I'll get to right now. 
So we have not seen any turtles at one marina that we then saw at another marina. So these turtles are pretty uh, uh, strict in staying at one marina, at least from our data that we've seen. Now this turtle was a turtle at the sea turtle hospital. So I was able to take a picture of the flipper. I emailed Kat Eastman, who is a wonderful person for putting up with all of my emails. She sent the hospital pictures. This was a turtle that was rescued at Kamachi Cove. We were able to match it to turtle 37 in our database. And then this is a picture from Conk House. So we saw that turtle June 26, July 17th at Kamachi Cove. That, was, that turtle was taken to the Sea Turtle Hospital in September, and we saw this turtle at Conk House on December 6th. So we were able to kind of see the turtle after it was released from the Turtle Hospital. And the goal is to work with the Sea Turtle Hospital to make sure we have those turtles included in the database so we can give them information about where the turtles have been, how often we've seen them, and if we're seeing them after they're released. Um, lots of people to thank for this project. Um, I'm happy to, to go through more in detail uh, in the chat if needed. Um, but also, if you get a chance, go to these marinas. There's some really cool things you can see at these marinas. Barracuda on the left there is a sooty sea hare, so a shellless gastropod. We've seen dolphins, manatees, tarpon. Um, so the project for being in the situation we were in when it started has been just a, a phenomenal project to work on. So thank you and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. McGinley. And I don't know if any of our attendees here um, have attended past symposiums, but Dr. McGinley has presented on his past marina research. Um, Steph Robinson says, I need a job where I can sit at marinas and look for cool critters. <laughs> it's, it's not a bad gig, I will say that. The, we have a group of people tuning in from the Sea Turtle Hospital at the Whitney Lab, and they want to know if, uh, if you use an underwater camera for some of these photos. Uh, thank you for, for asking that. I, I should have mentioned that during the methods. So my dean, when I originally started this, uh, agreed I could use some of my professional development funds. So we bought a DSLR camera. So the pictures at the beginning were strictly from above water. Um, two of my students, Jasmine and Michaela, they have been taking some pictures with, uh, with a GoPro. Um, so getting some pictures underwater, but it's, it's a mix. And the nice thing about the Hotspotter program is it, it's able to use both types of those photos, the angle, the lighting, it, it's pretty robust in changes in what the photograph looks like. So we got a little bit of both in terms of the types of photographs. Thank you. I have a question. Have you seen any evidence or do you have any evidence that um, the sea turtles may be aware that you might be taking pictures of them? Or is there any reaction from the turtles themselves when you, when you observe them at the marinas? And I would say for the most part, they're usually pretty calm and, and willing to let us take pictures there. There have been a couple times where we walked up and the turtle has seen us and, and kind of dove pretty quick. So when doing this, I try to be, and my students do as well, try to be very um, just kind of deliberate in our movements. We don't wanna make any sudden movements to startle the sea turtles. So for the most part, uh, a lot of them will stay there and just keep feeding and ignore us. Um, but we do have some that, that get away. So I've been trying to do a lot about five minutes to wait to see if a turtle will come back up um, after being startled. Um, if not, what I do is I take a picture of the water so we count that as a sighting, we just don't have data from that specific turtle to match to the database. Gotcha, thank you. Well, I don't see any other questions. So thank you, Dr. McGinley again for uh, presenting on this. 